years in all sorts of fields. Uh, I can remember well, many of them in, in the field of interstellar scintillation, which uh, is where we know Mark from, some of us at least. Um, but today he's going to be talking on something, a topic that, uh, that I haven't heard him speak about ever before, and I'm sure it's going to be uh, most entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffy. That was a very polite way of saying that I'm crazy to those of you who haven't come across me before. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, that's right, uh, as JP said, so today uh, we'll touch on very briefly on interstellar simulation. Uh, and mainly I'm going to talk about uh, interstellar dust. So, I'm also new to this field. Um, so, it's kind of an exciting little trip for me to my thing uh, is completely left field, so probably most of you will know that interstellar dust, uh, there is a fairly well developed uh, theory that is based <coughs> not on solid hydrogen but on silicates and graphites being the interstellar dust. Okay? Uh, my picture that I'm going to uh, propose today is, is quite different. Okay, we're working. <coughs> so, this is what I'm uh, going to run through. Uh, to make sure everybody's on the same page, because it's probably part of those backgrounds, uh, I want to talk very briefly about the uh, phenomena uh, into some of us phenomenology uh, and why that motivates the currently preferred, uh, currently uh, established model, uh, namely silicate graphite grains uh, for the interstellar dust. Uh, and then introduce you to uh, a problem um, that exists, uh, faces that. Uh, Particular model because all of the uh, astronomy is, of course, done remotely. So you infer the properties of the interstellar dust from its extinction characteristics and emission characteristics, and you don't get to grab bits of interstellar dust. Uh, but actually, you do because it streams through the solar system, uh, and uh, with spacecraft, uh, you can actually directly detect particles of dust, uh, some of which are interstellar, uh, and also uh, you can see them with radar. Reflecting uh, radar signals off the ionization trails from micrometeorites. Uh, so, again, some of those are interstellar in origin. Uh, and they show up a, a, a problem with the current model, which I'll talk about. Uh, and I'll say uh, why I think the solution to that is uh, that the dust be made of solid hydrogen and not of silicates or graphites. Uh, and then that begs the question well, where is this? particles of solid hydrogen come from, and so I'm only going to talk very briefly about that, um, but uh, it, it has to come from very cold and dense gas clouds, so that will, uh, those of you who know me from the interstellar, interstellar scintillation background, uh, will spot uh, where that's coming from, so that's actually quite old work now, uh, so I'm not going to talk much about it. What I'm going to talk mainly about is the survival uh, of solid hydrogen grains, because the first thing that pops into your mind is, well, you know, can this stuff really survive? You know, shouldn't it just evaporate suddenly in a year? Uh, and the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll talk about that. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, spectroscopic uh, evidence uh, on the, you know, so you'd say, in terms of the spectroscopy, uh, what would you expect solid hydrogen dust to look like? Uh, and it should be dominated uh, by molecular iron, like the H6 plus uh, iron. Uh, and <coughs> which is unique to solid hydrogen. Uh, it has certain vibrational lines which we know about, uh, and that suggests that in fact solid hydrogen is indeed uh, common uh, in the cell medium. Okay, so that's the sort of big picture of where we're going today. And here's an even bigger picture. Uh, this is, of course, the Sombrero galaxy, you probably all familiar with this one. Uh, so, apart from all the stars, you can see here a very prominent dust line. So, of course, most most of the information we get on interstellar dust comes from our own galaxy, not from extra galaxy studies, but this one, you know, you can just see, see the stuff so plainly uh, that I thought I'd use this. So, this is the Hubble Space Telescope uh, data and the optical, uh, and so you can see very clearly uh, there's uh, stuff absorbing the light from the stars. It's now very obvious to us, it took a while to get to that point uh, in the 1930s to be sure that space is in fact full of. Uh, solid particles, but now we, now we know that is the case. Uh, and then you ask, well, what are these particles? Well, what are they made of? Okay. And surprisingly enough, you can actually give an answer to that um, almost straight away from theory uh, about what these things are made of. Uh, 
So there's um, a bound called the Purcell limit called the Purcell bound, uh, going back to Purcell in 1969. Uh, we use the dispersion relations, the Kramer's chronic relations, uh, to determine from the observed absorption, so we know a certain amount of absorption of uh, starlight in every kilopass, like a path length. Uh, and that then tells you something on the volume fraction that the dust must occupy. So you have to have a minimum sort of volume fraction of space occupied by particles. Um, and that number um, turns out to be very big. Um, well, it turns out to be very small. Uh, it's a number like 10 to the minus 26 or something like that. Of all space has to be occupied by dust. Okay, so it's a very small number. But it's a very big number in terms of the stuff you've got available. Okay. It tells you uh, that, because uh, you know roughly how much uh, atomic hydrogen you've got uh, in a unit volume, uh, and you know from cosmic abundances of the various elements uh, how much of them you've got available for unit volume. And so just from that observation of basically how much obscuration is there in the optical, you can tell that this stuff is not like scandium or technetium or something like that. Okay. In fact, the only possibilities are the very commonest elements. Okay, so then you're talking about things like silicon, carbon, oxygen, things like this. Okay, those are the, the, uh, the elements you've got to play with. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty fundamental. Uh, okay, so that's why on the interstellar dust. And the other uh, basic angle, in fact, dust phenomenology is very rich, so uh, I'm not going to talk about much of it, just there's the extinction. And here's the other basic phenomenon. Uh, the emission in the infrared. So the particles absorb uh, energy in the starlight, from starlight, and then they re-emit that in the infrared band. Okay, so this that was an HST image. This is a Spitzer image of the same field, the sombrero galaxy. So now you can still see the stars in the sort of blue green color. Uh, that's the three micron band. Uh, and the eight and longer micron bands from Spitzer are shown here in pink and sort of red color. And uh, that's where the emission, seeing the emission from the dust, the dust is kind of gliding in the infrared. <coughs> okay. Um, so the Purcell band gives you a very crude um, insight into what the dust might be made of. Um, but if you want to go beyond that, uh, you can turn to spectroscopy. Okay, and spectroscopy of the dust means extinction and um, and emission. So what about the extinction? So then there's this thing called the extinction curve, which means as a function of wavelength, and this is actually one over the wavelength here, uh, so inverse wavelength in uh, per micron, uh, and the optical band is sort of here, that's the uh, RUV over there. And so this is the extinction in magnitudes uh, per uh, column of hydrogen. Okay. And so the main feature of this, well, obviously, there's a strong increase to the, uh, to the UV. Um, but also, there's this bump here, 2200 angstroms. This is seen almost everywhere. Uh, and uh, that one was recognized uh, almost immediately after it was discovered in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, people identified that with um, sort of graphitic structures. Uh, so it's the pi. Uh, pi orbitals, the pi bonding orbitals uh, of the uh, sort of ring like carbon. Okay. So, graphite, or uh, if you get them to really small rings, then you're talking about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules. Okay. Uh, and then the other features that you can see here, if you've got good eyesight, you can probably see the little uh, lips um, here in the optical. Those are what's called the diffuse interstellar bands. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about them. Uh, <coughs> Because uh, nobody knows what they are. Uh, and uh, this is a, so up here, the panel up here is the zoom in of this corner here. So you can see uh, here at 10 microns, uh, there is a uh, band, strong absorption band, um, which is identified with silicates. As I said, silicon and oxygen have to be in there. Uh, and there's another little bit there. And then there's an, some sort of feature around. 19 microns, 20 microns. <coughs> this is a theoretical curve. It comes from Bruce Strain. In fact, I'm going to show a whole sequence of slides from Bruce Strain. Those of you who don't know him, he's the senior dust theorist. Uh, 
has been for quite some time. Uh, <coughs> um, what else did I need to say? That's, that was most of it. Uh, so anyway, these are the right motivations for carbon, specific motivations for carbon and for silicate in the extinction curve. Uh, and what about in the emission? Okay, so then uh, here we can look at some interstellar gas in the Orion bar. This is from Alice Peters. So this is not theory, this is now from my model. This is the DPT data. Um, and uh, so the, the zero point is sort of somewhere around here. Uh, and so you can see a whole bunch of strong lines in this mid infrared region, uh, three to three microns. So this is what's usually known as the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon bands, the H bands. Okay, so all of these in here uh, are, are conventionally interpreted in those terms. Okay, so there's yet more uh, motivation for thinking about uh, remote carbon. Okay, so now here's a detailed model again from Bruce Jay. Um, so this one goes back to Weingartner and Gray in 2001. And this is just constructed from the extinction curve, actually. So not only do you have to have a certain um, composition, but you have to have a certain range of sizes uh, in this model. Uh, and in this model, that's what they come out to be. So you can see here there's two contributions. There's a carbon contribution in pink, uh, which isn't doing much, isn't contributing very much uh, over this way, uh, this side. Scale, but down here at the very smallest end, uh, it's dominating. So, this is a huge range, and you can probably see it's logarithmic uh, on this axis, so it's covering a huge range of masses. Um, but both are cutting off uh, above the size of about 0.1 micron. That's what this is the mass scale, but it, that's what it corresponds to roughly in radius, about 0.1 micron here, a peak, and then sharply cutting off. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why this cuts off so sharply is that uh, you have no uh, choice within this, you know, if you're modeling the dust in terms of silicates and graphites, you, uh, you run up against the abundance bounds. So I said earlier on there was only certain elements and you had to use silicate carbon and so on. And so even if you use these elements, you still have a problem. Okay? So there are published dust models that uh, actually use more than the available abundances in order to explain the extinction that you see. Okay? And so that's why this cuts off here, because this plot is basically a plot uh, of where the contribution uh, is uh, coming, uh, which uh, size scale dominates the uh, contribution to the density uh, in uh, plus grains. Okay? And so you can see this peak here means that these grains here are dominating the contribution to the yeah, total density of dust. Uh, and so if you allow more grains here, you can you will use up more, uh, more uh, of the elements that you have available. Specifically, this curve, these, these models, they use up all of your silicon, uh, they use up all of your magnesium, all of your iron, uh, and half of your carbon. Okay, so they're very tightly constrained. <coughs> and now turning to, uh, turning to the data from the solar system, I said there was a problem, and there is the problem. Uh, oh, I should say, if anybody's got any questions, just, you know, if I just stop making sense, and just yell out, you know, let me shine. <coughs> I don't know how that works for the people online, but, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll relay that, but I have a okay. question. So is yes. this just one model, and you speak to a particular distribution of grains? So this is just what these instruments that you get from that model. That's right. Yeah. Many. There's many possible models. So you can see this one's got sort of lumps and bumps in it because that's what they chose to optimize certain features. In fact, it's just optimized to the extinction curve, basically. Uh, but yes, there's many there's flexibility to make all sorts of different models, and you can twiddle things around a bit. Uh, but all of them have this common feature that they cut off sharply here for exactly that reason. It's quite a fundamental property. Uh, don't want to use up all that you've got. Um, but uh, as you can see here from these, uh, these data points, this, these are measurements assessed from Ulysses and Galileo. Uh, so there's two, two different spacecraft, and they had impact detectors, dust impact detectors on them, so they could measure fluxes of particles of different sizes, different directions, and so on. 
uh, <coughs> and um, of course uh, certain uh, parts of orbital phase space are dominated by inflammatory dust, so stuff that's come from uh, disintegrating asteroids or something, and so you can pick up those things, dust from comets, all these kinds of things. But there's also a component you can pick up on uh, interstellar dust streaming through the solar system. And a very small, for the very smallest particles, it's strongly modulated by uh, the termination shock of the solar wind, because they've got to get in. Uh, and then they're typically charged, and so they've got to propagate through the magnetic field structures in the solar system. And so that uh, wipes out a lot of what goes on down here. So you shouldn't worry that these points here uh, are below this curve. That's not really a concern. What is a concern is that these points up here, which just shouldn't be there. Okay. So uh, in what sense shouldn't they be there? Well, I just talked about the uh, abundances. Uh, but also, just in terms of the extinction curve, uh, if you calculate, um, so the, here's the line out there and drain the model extinction curve, plotted in yellow. Here, uh, so it's the same, same format as the one I showed you earlier, more or less. Uh, and then here's the sort of typical measurements for a diffuse cloud plotted in white. Uh, and here's what you would get if you just added in those extra dust particles that you see uh, in the inflammatory. Interplanetary spacecraft dust detectors. Okay? So you can see the uh, extinction curve rises much too rapidly in the infrared. That's the problem. It's definitely, whatever the uh, stellar extinction curve is, is definitely not that. Okay? So Bruce Strong says very clearly here uh, Ulysses size distribution cannot be characteristic of the diffuse ISM based on the reddening alone. So it's not just reddening, in fact, uh, it goes beyond that. Okay? Right here at the edge of the plot, uh, you know, what happens uh, is a good question. So, uh, you know, the convenient end is just there, but if you ask about larger particles, what happens then? Well, the spacecraft detectors are only have a rather small size, so you, you just don't have enough area to detect big particles. Not many of them. But you can do that with radar. Okay, so the Earth provides a pretty big area, and so you know you can see micrometeorites coming in, see the radar trails. So this is being done with Arecibo, uh, and also with the pioneering work that's really done in New Zealand by Jack Bagley at Canterbury and his AMOR uh, system, AMOR, I don't know what the acronym stands for. Um, but anyway, to answer that question, what happens when you go to large masses, uh, larger dust grain masses, uh, and Arecibo sees larger dust grains, uh, and AMOR sees even larger dust grains. Now, those observations are very controversial for the reason that while here, if you accept that these particles are there, that sort of uses up twice as much stuff as you've got. If you go out to these larger particles, you use like 50 or 100 times as much stuff as you've got. So that's really a problem. So they've caused a lot of controversy, though. So everybody kind of agrees with, you know, everybody's happy with these. There's enough wiggle room, you know, that you could get away with it, but it's only a factor of two in astronomy. Well, it's a factor of 50 or 100, that's a big problem. Shoot, if you were to forget those extinction curves altogether and just integrate out of the mass that you measure from our Arecibo and from the spacecraft and all the experiments, how much mass do you actually use up there at right? Is, is that in itself a problem? You mean as in sort of dynamically or? Uh, well, if you presumably, if you assemble that out of carbon and silicates alone, and I presume you don't actually know the composition of things from, from the Crime. More or less, that's correct. Yeah. But if you were to presume that it's carbon and silicon, so forget the extinction curves, yeah. and just integrate under the, the, yeah. the mass function that you yeah. get anyway yeah. from these actual measurements, yeah. would you run up against a, a mass uh, or an abundance uh, problem there anyway? Yes. So the, the, the abundance problem I'm speaking of is sort of independent of the. Uh, oh, you mean so, so I can all this bit and just integrate from here? That's right. Yes. yes. Totally. Yeah, because I mean, here, this, 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 under these curves here, from the Bruce Strange theoretical curves, you've got about one, about your correct amount, if you like, of the silicon carbon, whatever. Uh, here, you've got about the same, but it's not in the right place. Uh, and if you keep going, and if you believe the radar results, then it's like a factor of 100 more. So you've so, got as much mass as you have in hydrogen. So you basically. So then you're forced to uh, to accept that the, the composition that cannot simply be uh, 
Well, that's my argument. So there's two possibilities. You can either say that uh, the bit of the ISM that we're measuring, the local ISM, is special. And historically, that's been a pretty bad assumption to make in astronomy, and that we're in a special place in the universe. Uh, and so, um, so my argument is, yes, it's not made of silicate and graphite. And in fact, it's not just that it's not made of silicate and graphite. If you're a hundred times more, you need a hundred times more stuff that you've got available. There's only one, but well, there's two options. You have hydrogen, you can have helium. And helium is a lot harder to condense than hydrogen is, so those two you can pick hydrogen. Even if you go all the way down there to this point, 
you still haven't got enough pressure in the diffuse medium to be able to uh, condense the precipitate out the solid. So you don't expect to make any sort of hydrogen in the diffuse medium. Okay. And that's why uh, it was chucked out, the idea was chucked out uh, in the late 1960s. <coughs> so where am I saying the solid hydrogen comes from? Well, what you need is, uh, should just go back, you need to, uh, if you want to precipitate it out, uh, you've got to get the pressure from there up to there, okay, or somewhere up here. And there's no problem doing that, you just can't do it in the diffuse and still immediate by elevation. Okay, so what you need is, you need a bottle to put your high pressure gas in, the bottle is provided by a gravitational field, so you need a self-gravitating gas clamp to do that. Okay. <coughs> so you're going to need uh, pressure of water, the saturation pressure, which is much greater than the diffuse interstellar pressure, so it's not part of the diffuse ice and self gravitating. Uh, and that's much denser than anything we know about, than the instrument colder than anything we know about from the diffuse ice and So this has to be a new population of gas clouds. So this was proposed back in 1994, Fager and Holmes, and Fager and Holmes and Martin it. Uh, and then a whole bunch of other papers looking at variants on their basic idea. Uh, some of which were contributed by me with Mark Wardle, uh, looking at the, these uh, sort of ideas. Uh, and of course, uh, this stuff is dark, uh, and you can't see it. Uh, it's not the list of states that we know, but there isn't any stuff like this in the current catalogue. We don't have kind of places we can point to and say, here's a gas cloud like that, but it's dark matter, and it's baryonic. Uh, my take on this. Uh, JP said, I'm sort of an intercell scintillation guy. Uh, and so the work I did with Mark Wardle uh, identified these uh, radio wave scintillation events, which are known as extreme scattering events, um, published by Ralph Fiedler initially. Um, so you can see here one in the middle of this light curve, two different frequencies, this is 8 point something gigahertz and 2.7 gigahertz. Um, and you can see very clearly there's an event going on. And everybody agrees this is a radio wave lensing event. So there's some ionized gas that's refracting the radio wave. Uh, radio waves are causing apparent change in flux. Um, and so our interpretation of this, uh, I, I cannot do argue, but not today, uh, that uh, this has to have an underlying neutral cloud, not just ionized gas, but has to have an underlying neutral, uh, self gravitating spherical gas cloud. Okay. So I'm not going to go, so I'm not going to go into that. If you're interested, go look at it. If you don't know about it, go look in the literature. Uh, the basic points are, I guess, that the radii are of order an AU, and that just comes from this time scale. Uh, and the masses then turn out to be planetary for the individual gas clouds. Okay. So that's where I'm suggesting uh, particles of solid hydrogen come from. You can make them in these clouds, no problem, because the Saturate the gas pressure uh, as close to the saturation pressure, and then once you're at that point, it's quite easy to get those particles into the uh, diffuse ice end. Uh, as the clouds move through the diffuse ice end, they'll strip off little bits in the outside of the cloud, so you'll leave behind a kind of trail uh, of solid uh, of grains, uh, solid hydrogen. And also, if you disrupt these things, uh, if you pump them in, the, pump too much heat into them, like with a supernova flash or something. You will, in fact, um, if you, you know, great irony of self gravitating clouds is that if you heat them, they cool. Okay? So, um, go and have a look at the burial theorem. If you don't believe me, it's completely true. But as you heat them, they expand. Uh, and of course, the temperature is the mass over the radius. So, if you increase the radius, the temperature goes down. Okay? Pump heat into a self gravitating gas cloud, it cools. And if you pump enough heat into it, not only will it cool, but you'll actually disrupt it. Uh, and so, uh, so if you do that, then what you end up doing, you cool, you come down to lower temperatures, you hit the saturated vapor pressure curve, uh, in fact, quite quickly because you're quite close to there already. And then you just create more and more solid. And if you're unwinding it, then all that solid goes into the ice and form. Okay. Uh, so the form of this curve, and I'm not going to go into the derivation of it, um, but it's like a power law, uh, which is sort of incidental, uh, and then this Boltzmann factor. Okay? And the Boltzmann factor has, uh, of course, usual 
uh, energy over kT, and I've expressed the energy as a temperature, so I've got the ultimate constant in there. Uh, and that's it's this fact that's providing essentially all the variation uh, of this range, of these many orders of magnitude. Uh, and what that energy corresponds to in this equation, or in this uh, context, uh, is the sublimation energy of an individual molecule of my molecule. So that's how much energy it takes to kick the thing out of the surface of the solid, about 91 Kelvin. <coughs> so uh, that's a, a quite a uh, small number, uh, and that's what um, makes the solid a very volatile solid. Okay. So the thing that holds solid hydrogen together is just the amount of Lyell's forces, the dispersion forces. Um, between neutral and molecules. There's no polarity in H2, so the binding is very, very weak. But by the same token, if there's any, uh, any kind of charges hanging around there, as we know is the case, in the dust grains in the slime medium, uh, then they'll have a strong influence on this. Okay? Because when you have uh, charges, you have Coulomb attraction, uh, and that could change, potentially, that could change that number quite uh, significantly. So, <coughs> While uh, there's no doubt that the um, pure solid isn't going to, uh, you can't form it in the interstellar medium, uh, and it will also evaporate very quickly because it's a bit like being in vacuum. If you're in the interstellar medium, here's the, here's the pressure, and here's the, um, the pressure that you need to have equilibrium between the incoming flux and outgoing flux of molecules. And so you can see it's effectively like putting a solid in a vacuum. It will just all sublimate. Um, but if the binding energy is increased for any reason because of charges, uh, then that could change this uh, uh, quite a bit because it's exponentially sensitive. So let's have a look at that and see if that actually makes any difference. Uh, charging of dust grains is not new, it's part of the standard law of uh, stellar uh, grain uh, physics. So what happens uh, is there's two processes that contribute, and one of them is uh, collisional charging. What that means is that you've just got this very dilute plasma that's always it's not everywhere in the oxygen, very low level, so free electrons and, and ions. Um, and they uh, they'll hit those particles which hit the grain and stick to the grain. Uh, and because electrons, uh, electrons and positive ions will have equal number densities on average, and but your electrons move faster, and so what that means is that if you've got collisional charging only, then they don't charge up negative, grains charge up. The, the flux exceeds that of the protons. Um, and then if you have uh, photoelectric charging uh, playing the dominant role, so you've got photons coming in and kicking off electrons to infinity, uh, and if that dominates, then the grain charges as a whole and it's positive. Okay, it's so positive. And then generally we have both of these things going on. Um, okay, so we could then proceed to estimate this for uh, hydrogen grains. Uh, and the way uh, sort of uh, estimates that we would make uh, would look uh, something like this. So it's always the case that you uh, charge up your grain to a point where it reaches an equilibrium in charging rates. Uh, as you push the total charge in the grain higher, then that makes it harder to I think, to get the other charge. Speech. Uh, uh, How does this work? Let's say you put a uh, strong negative charge on the grain that repels electrons. So then it becomes harder to get more negative charge on the brain. Um, and so the limit uh, always turns out to be something on order uh, volts. So, for example, your starlight has energies of electron volts. Uh, so that's like taking an electron through a voltage of uh, all unity. Um, so that's the sort of limit you typically expect. Uh, and in terms of electric field, what does that correspond to? Uh, well, let's say your brain radius is a few microns, and so you've got a few volts dropped over a few microns, and uh, that gives you an electric of a million volts per meter per order. Okay. Now, what difference does that make? Let's suppose we've got this charge grain, what difference does that make? Well, what it means is that your surface molecules of hydrogen, your H2 molecules, are slightly polarized by that electric field. Okay. So the charge is slightly shifted, so one in the slightly positive. One slightly negative. Uh, and that is actually uh, a binding, it's like a, a more stable state for the hydrogen molecule to be in. 
If you wanted to take it out of that electric field, you'd have to do some work just to overcome that electrical polarization. Okay? Uh, and that corresponds to uh, something that's well known. You uh, compute the energy associated with the polarization. It has this form, it goes as the square of the electric field, and there's a coefficient that depends on what the molecule is called polarizability. Uh, and that's well known, it was calculated decades ago. And it's a very small number. So, with this field of 56 volts per meter, what you end up with is a contribution uh, to the binding energy, the sublimation energy, of about 10 microkelvin, which is extremely tiny uh, in comparison to 90 kelvin. So, you do this order of magnitude estimate, as all good theoretical astrophysicists should do, to find out before they make a detail theory whether it's worth making a detail theory. If you do it like this, you can find it's completely uh, hopeless, that would be completely wrong. And yeah, this is why. So the electronic band structure of uh, solid hydrogen is totally different uh, to normal band structure. Normal band structure of a solid, so in other words, where the electrons can be in energy levels, and looks like this. So this is energy uh, here, in this direction, uh, and this direction is meaningless, really. There's a valence band uh, for your insulator, like the silicate I've got here. The valence band is full. Then there's a band gap where there are no land states with electrons. Then there's the conduction band, okay, which is normally empty. Uh, and the vacuum level is up here. Uh, and that's critical. So when you're charging up your uh, silicate brain, you have an electron at infinity, uh, and uh, you can drop it into the conduction band, and it eventually falls down into the valence band. And for solid hydrogen, it looks like this. Okay. So not a huge change, you might think. It just shifted the conduction band up a bit. But the fact that it's now above uh, the vacuum level uh, yeah, is really critical. Uh, so the reason why it's up there, I should say, is it's very unusual. Almost all solids, like almost all of them, uh, are in this Kessler category here. Uh, and the reason why solid hydrogen looks like this uh, is that it's um, you have to sort of do work to get, get the electron into the solid. Why is that? Well, with a hydrogen molecule, you have a spin pair electron. Okay, you have two electrons spin paired. And it's a bit like a helium atom. Okay. Uh, and it's very stable. It's why there are no other bonds. You know, it's like your hydrogen doesn't bond with anything else because it's got all its uh, sort of minimum energy configuration. Same is true for helium and the other notable gases. Um, and that's why it just if you pack, if you pack your solid, your solid is basically just wall-to-wall uh, -wall, uh, hydrogen molecules. You pack them as tightly as you can, so there's just no room for any more electrons. Okay, so you really have to force them in, and that means doing work. And that's why the conduction band is above the vacuum level. And this property was shared only uh, with the noble gas condensates, so like helium and solid neon. Okay. Uh, and really, it actually looks a bit more like this. This is a little bit of bending. In the vacuum state. Uh, that's because of polarization of the, as you bring the charge up close to the solid, it polarizes the solid a bit, so it's attracted to it. Uh, and so, anyway, the, if you fire an electron in here, no problem, it just rolls in, chunk, uh, and then maybe down to the balance band. And for solid hydrogen, what happens is that your electron comes in, bang, hits the surface of the solid, but there's nowhere for it to go. It doesn't have enough energy to get into the conduction band. So what does it do? Well, it loses a bit of energy as it hits the surface, so it gets a biron to pop it off, uh, and it won't be able to get back out to infinity, but it can't get into the conduction band either. So what does it do? It's kind of stuck. And it is, it's stuck. It sticks to the surface. So it ends up in a vacuum state, not in the solid, but above the solid, and above the surface, but stuck to the solid. So totally different in its electronic property. So this is how it then works out for uh, solid hydrogen. You have the same process is going on. Um, and now the sun looks like this. You have a few volts, again, as your typical uh, potential drop. Uh, but now the L, the typical length scale over which you're dropping that, is the length scale over which the wave function of your uh, surface electrons is significant. And that turns out to be only a few angstroms. So it's nothing to do with the size of the grain. 
And then you ratio those two, you get no longer 10 to the 6, but 10 to the 10. So you've got a factor of 10 to the 4 difference, and in the polarization energy, it goes as a square. So you've no longer got 10 microkelvin, you've got 1,000 kelvin. And that is big compared to the, <coughs> the binding energy. There's no electric field throughout. Okay, so much order of magnitude bigger. This is a huge difference in sublimation rate. Uh, oh, okay, so we don't really need to look at this. This is just the plot of how actually a grain charges up, a solid hydrogen grain charges up uh, in the warm neutral medium. Uh, logarithmic uh, number density, so number per unit area of electrons and ions, uh, and logarithm of time. Uh, so you can set up differential equations and solve them. And you've got two components to, to worry about. Now you've got the electrons outside the solid, and you've got ions in the solid. And so I was really only making the point that the last arguments are very hand wavy, but you can formulate these things pretty concretely okay, and solve the differential equations. And the key thing is what happens out here after a long time. What's this, uh, what's this uh, charge that you're in? Uh, how many electrons and what's the electric field? Uh, and that turns out to be independent of grain size or temperature in the ice and what it's in the ice and what it's in the ice. So broadly speaking, that's how it works out. Uh, and what does that do to your vapor pressure curve? So I showed you previously one with the, there's the microwave background temperature and the interstellar medium pressure, and you'll notice that's no longer down here, but now up here. Uh, so it's still in the same place, it's just that the saturated vapor pressure of the fully charged grain now sits down here. So now the entire range of temperatures, uh, your, in the interstellar medium, your uh, pressure is above the saturated vapor pressure. So what that means is that if you can inject grains, solid hydrogen into the ISM, they'll survive. Uh, just on the basis of this calculation. There's other things you should worry about, like sputtering through market, which I haven't uh, addressed at all. But the key point is that the thermodynamics are nothing like uh, as primitive as they have for the last 40 years. Uh, okay, so uh, any questions on that? I'm kind of uh, confused about your plot, so plot percentages of phase. I don't understand the equivalent of phase you have that plot. Sorry, the, which one did I have? The this plot, one? No, your plot versus this, the one you were showing up for scintillation. Ah. Uh, yeah, there is a plot there, you have your days, number of days, you have some negative values of days. Ah, uh, well, it's just our arbitrary, it's an arbitrary zero. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but to be honest, I don't, uh, I'm happy to talk with you about that afterwards, but uh, for many people that would be tedious because I've talked about it so often before. I'd rather not spend the time in the cloak and talk about it if that's okay. So you said, Mark, that if you can inject these into the ice and they'll survive, but how big do you have to make them before they're likely to survive? Is there an initial value? Is there a boundary condition to, to somehow to this problem that you've got to you've got to make a, a little grain, a solid grain of this H two in the first place for it to survive? Is there a problem actually forming that, or do you take that as a given? In, in, uh, at the moment, I'm taking that as a given because I don't actually have a proper model that shows how you, how you populate a galaxy with such grains. So I just gave you a hand wavy. Then said that if you have this population of very cold, dense gas clouds zipping around, uh, as I uh, argue there are, then you'll get such grains uh, from them. And the size is unknown. Uh, what what the size spectrum would be that comes out of that is unknown. Um, so I can't say too much about that. Um, yeah. That's an unsatisfactory answer to your question, isn't it? No, it's a perfectly satisfactory answer to the question. It's, it just would be nice. It would be nice to know. know. It would be nice to know. I mean, you'd like to have a, a polymer theory that told you all these things. Maybe we'll be able to do that. Um, but being a bit more focused on the, um, on the survival issue, because if you know it's not going to survive, then no matter how many things you inject the ISM with, it's kind of irrelevant. I should say that the if you take just the pure H2 thermodynamics, 
and lichen size, sub lichen size grain of H2 would be gone in three months. So it really is uh, uh, irrelevant if it wasn't for this charging. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, the argument about having a neutral hybrid layer that uh, was there from, uh, you know, right from the time of observations. But, I mean, you can only get uh, the direct constraints that would come from just the density and probably the size, and then you have to make all these assumptions about uh, temperature and so on to talk about all the trends like that. You're talking about the extreme scattering? Yes. Yeah. So, where, where is the uh, you know, just elaborate a bit on where does that argument about so everything in there in the cloud coming from? Uh, well, as I said a minute ago, I'd rather not I'll happily talk with you about that personally, but I feel like I've kind of laboured all those points yeah. before quite heavily, so I'd rather not do it again with this audience, but after, let's talk about that question. Um, so a key question is, you know, I've said, oh, look, you know, all the in the cell medium is full of hydrogen grains, and so, you know, you should say at that point, well, come on, then, where's the evidence? Uh, presumably, there's some predictions from this model about what uh, the uh, dust properties should look like, uh, and you know, show me that that, uh, that that's what's actually out there. And so, it's very early days yet because it's all fairly new. But one um, thing which is quite interesting and been quite exciting um, in that nerdy way that we recognise physicists to find things exciting, well, all those physicists find things exciting, um, is that the hydrogen ionisation chemistry is totally different in the gas phase and the solid phase. So the gas phase ionization chemistry is well known for, for molecular hydrogen. What happens is if you ionize the molecular hydrogen, of course you get H2 plus. Uh, and then what, the next thing that happens is that it will react with another H2 plus. Okay, and so then you end up with H3 plus and a spare atom. But this is a very well known reaction and, and uh, well studied. Um, and that's about all there is to say to it. It's quite Clearly. Now, uh, if you had solid hydrogen, how would things look any different? Would you not just get the same thing? Well, this is what's called a two-body reaction, for obvious reasons. And uh, if you think just the, even about basic chemistry, then when the density goes up, uh, then that favours a higher number of uh, reactant bodies. So in other words, that would favour more uh, three-body reaction over a two-body reaction. And of course, the density of solid hydrogen is like 20 orders of magnitude higher than the interstellar gas form. Okay? So, <laughs> really, it favors three body reaction uh, very strongly relative to the gas phase. So, what you might expect uh, is that instead of reacting with one H2, you react with two H2s. Um, and then, what is that going to make? That's going to make H6. Plus. And that incredibly naive uh, form of argument might be some approximation to what actually happens because we know that the ionization chemistry, we know from lab studies, that the ionization chemistry of the solid is very different to that of the gas. In the gas, you get uh, basically only H3. Plus. Uh, and in the solid, we know that there's a significant population of yes, this is our molecule H6. Plus. So if you've never heard of this, don't worry, because it's only discovered in the last 10 years uh, using electron spin resonance studies. Uh, so Japanese groups, and the theory was also done by Japanese groups, that's kind of a Japanese molecule. Um, <clears throat> and this is what it looks like. That's what H6 plus looks like. So H3 plus has a kind of equilateral triangle structure. Uh, and uh, totally different, so you can see this is not based on H3 plus in any way. It's a quite different sequence. Um, so that was amazing when I discovered that. I was very, I was very excited by that. Um, but then there was frustration because there's no mass spectra. Okay, so what you would like is sort of some electronic spectra, or, uh, you know, electronic transition spectra, or infrared vibrational transition spectra. There's so few that there aren't any. There's only this paramagnetic resonance stuff uh, that isn't really that much used to uh, astronomy. So uh, I went cap in hand to the ANU uh, quantum chemistry theory group and said, here, there's only a little molecule with only six electrons, actually five electrons in it. Please, could you calculate uh, the um, vibrational properties of this molecule? And they were really, really nice. And said, yes, if we could 
we could do that. Um, so it was uh, these guys, well, Peter Gill, who's the head of the group, was uh, heavily involved early on, but ultimately the people who did the work were Lee Kuen and Andrew Gilbert. Um, so they just modeled this quantum mechanically, this molecule quantum mechanically on their uh, supercomputer. Um, so it's a, what we call an ab initio model, which means you do everything from the ground up, not making any assumptions or approximations. Uh, and it's a very high level of theory that's been used. Uh, these are names, I don't know if there are any quantum chemistry people here today, but uh, it's coupled cluster with single and double excitations and uh, correlation consistent polarized valence only triple zeta function basis. Yes, and that's as much as I know about this quantum chemistry lab. That's different to what I do. And the things that you can relate to about this molecule, about the modeling of it, uh, it's highly unharmonic, uh, both because it's not very tightly bound, it has only a couple of unique climbing energy, um, and it's also got um, the lightest, well, the lightest atoms in there, of course. And hydrogen is uh, as good as it's as light as you can go. Uh, so it explores a lot of the potential, but that means the anharmonic terms are quite important. So it's not just a quadratic, uh, but the cubic and the quartic terms are important. Uh, and actually, if we could have gone higher, we would have liked, we would have liked to have done that, but we ran out of compute resources. Uh, so the thing that was used is this vibrational configuration interaction method. Uh, and we were only able to model five of the modes. It has 12 modes of vibration, but we really only got good model uh, for five of them. You can ask me why again if you're interested in that. Um, and the other thing to say is that uh, you can, of course, have different isotopomers because there's deuterium as well as just the proton type hydrogen atom, uh, H1. Uh, and so you uh, expect the dominant isotopomers to be either the the H6 plus isotopomer or the HD3 plus isotopomer, uh, which uh, this one will dominate uh, if you allow the molecule to hang around with that hydrogen uh, because it's energetically preferred for the HD molecule to condense onto this one, uh, the H2 molecule to come off. So what you end up with then is HD, HD, HD. Okay. So the relevant astrophysical models are uh, can be used to get more molecules and isotopomers. So what do the spectra of those things look like? Uh, well, I'll show you one for each. Uh, so I'm going to show you them against astronomical data because you want to know whether or not they're there. Uh, these things are emphasized only for <coughs> condensed hydrogen. So if you see these things, you know not condensed hydrogen, so I'll tell you. Okay. So this is a mid-IR absorption spectrum of a protostar, actually a minus 29. And that's just picked because it had these nice big absorption lines in it, um, but they're very common absorption lines. So here there's one at three microns. Uh, conventionally, that's attributed to water ice, the so H2O ice. Uh, and this one at uh, 10 microns, almost 10 microns, is so it's set before conventionally attributed to silicate. Uh, and then there's these other CO, narrow CO2 lines. Uh, and that's where uh, the H6 plus isotope lines sit as absorption lines. Okay. And then uh, you can also ask about emissions. So I showed you earlier that what we call the PAH lines. So these things here. That's the same plot again from the Orion map. Uh, the only addition now is a stick diagram so I've shown you the locations in wavelength uh, of the HD3 plus uh, vibrational lines, uh, these solid lines are the five modes that we uh, uh, accurate characterizations of. So you can see these two correspond closely to those that pair there. They get one under this one and two underneath these. So they're not exactly under, but of course, although this is a very good level of theory, it's not perfect. So you shouldn't worry uh, too much about that discrepancy. That's consistent with the, the accuracy of the calculation. Sure. Do you know anything about the relative strengths? We do an absorption because the absorption goes directly with the oscillator strength. So that's where the strengths came from on this one. What's that? Like the the line is indicating the strength. The, the depth of the line is indicating the strength in this case. But when you go into emission, uh, the emission line strengths are much harder to get at. Uh, they're determined by what's called the Frank Condon principle, which basically says that the electronic transition to a higher energy state, which is when you absorb a photo, optical photon, 
happens so quickly that the configuration, the, that the atoms don't move anywhere. So you go into a new potential surface, and with the atoms still in their same spot, and then they, you know, at the time, then they start vibrating around, etc. <coughs> it's the, that population of vibrational states, uh, is, that's how the population of vibrational states is determined, and ultimately they all come out as IR photons, and that's what determines the number of each mode of IR photons that can be So it's more, much more complicated to get at those lines, right? So we don't really have that information. The only thing we do know is that this light ratio is probably, uh, okay, so you see these two lines very close together, uh, and so you might, uh, they're sort of very similar in some respect. But one is an anti symmetric mode, and one is a symmetric mode of a particular type, which I can show you if you're interested. Uh, and that means that, in fact, we expect uh, this one to be much stronger, because normally you expect the potential uh, distortions to be, broadly speaking, symmetric. Uh, and that's what this one is given. So, so it is not really very much information at the moment. Uh, see, the main, uh, the main comment to make about this is that these, what, these coincidences are good, so where we know what the lines are, they coincide. But if you go have good theory, you might well be able to explain that as well. And can we do that? I don't know. Yes, in principle we could, because uh, the modes that we haven't characterized properly yet could sit in the here. But at the moment, we just don't know. Yeah. So, uh Prior to you, what, what were these lines attributed to? Probably slightly aromatic hydrocarbons. Oh, so just pull out the PAHs. Yeah. And yeah. 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 So, so you can find a PAH that happens to emit at, uh, at those wavelengths? Or? No. Oh, right. Well, yes. Uh, yes and no. So you can find a PAH, you can find lots of PAH molecules which uh, have um, emission in the right sort of general areas, but if you want to reproduce the spectrum, you have to add hundreds of pH, of different pH molecules. Uh, and it's actually worse, so, so that raises actually green alarm levels to anybody that tried any modeling in astrophysics. As soon as you have more than one true parameter, you can explain anything. Uh, and it's worse than that because, um, I don't know if pH people are using. Uh, it's worse than that because this line here at uh, 3.4 microns. Which comes out naturally as a pair here in HD3. Uh, it just doesn't come out from the PAHs. And so, not only do you have to invoke these, sort of this population of oxide aromatic hydrocarbons, you have to have aliphatic hydrocarbons, the long chain ones as well, just to get that 3.4 micro line. So, AB cycles of the PAHs. Uh, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it was him, everybody. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so you can draw your own conclusions, yeah. Um, where does the H3 plus, um, where do those lines lie? Would they lie on this or? Uh, you mean actually the H3 plus, not the HD3 plus? Yeah. Um, I don't know where they lie on this, but nobody has ever proposed, uh, I should actually know that, but I don't know, right? But nobody's ever proposed that these lines are uh, associated with H3 plus, even though it's uh, being studied in. Oh, it's been certainly detected um, in astronomical environments, so we really don't know there is H3 plus out there in space. But uh, I think I can confidently say that they're not in the right place to explain these lines. But the risk of saying it like I didn't occur in the previous uh, diagram, the strengths would, the absorption strengths would appear to be around the wrong way. Do you have any explanation for that other than the fact that the, the theory is? Somewhat imprecise. Uh, I'd say that I don't know what the absorption strengths are, uh, the appropriate absorption strengths for all that spectrum. So if you try and do any modeling, um, even when the lines are narrower, like so this uh, line here, the strength of the line depends totally on where the continuum is. Nobody tells you where the continuum is. Now, if you have a really narrow line, so you have a line, you have a proper slope, and you have a very narrow line. It's not that hard. You can see, you know, <coughs> you just extrapolate from either side. But how do you extrapolate here? And how do you know, uh, you know, just how do you know where the continuum is here? I don't know. There's presumably other spectra of protostars uh, where you might have except the experience there. 
I don't know. It, it, it's generically very difficult when you've got broad lines, both from uh, things like, which is quite basic, like what's the equivalent width, which is what you're asking about. Uh, but also the IDs we're also encountering. Uh, so when you try to identify a, a broad line, it's very difficult. It's not like saying, a narrow line and what that is. So the generic are very difficult to work with. We can sort of segues into this other absorption now. So, and those two, the conventional law is that those two actually go together. So it's actually quite, yeah, this is fundamentally difficult here, I think, with working with the data in this regime. Is the width of these absorption features sort of, is it just due to natural? Uh, yeah, so the, these lines that I've, these stick lines that I've drawn here are just, of course, where the vibrational mode fits. On top of that would be a lot of rotational band structure that goes in it, and we haven't calculated uh, what that is yet. Um, uh, and then on top of that, there'd be other broadening mechanisms. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, I won't show my animations because I think uh, we've spent enough time. In fact, now I'm running, so I'll go a little bit faster, so there isn't much more to say. I uh, just wanted to make the point that if you look at the very broadband emission spectrum, but this is taken from a whole galaxy, I can't remember which one, uh, on the Sims survey. Uh, so here around the micron, this bump here is, of course, just the stars. Uh, and then you segue into uh, emission from the interstellar medium. Uh, which, and this is a sort of new as new plot, so in fact, all this is really energetically very important. Uh, so here are the uh, so called pH bands that we've just been looking at. Um, <coughs> but if you want to say that dust is just solid hydrogen, you better have to then explain this as well. Okay, where's that coming from? Well, this molecular ion isn't going to occur uh, in isolation, it's embedded in the solid, uh, so it's what you call solvated. Uh, and there are lots of modes associated with that. So the, the uh, uh, high H2 molecules around it form some sort of shell. Uh, and that shell has its own modes of vibration, many, many more. Uh, some of the order 80 or 85 modes just associated with uh, the clustering around this ion here. Uh, and they would all be at relatively low frequencies because they're relatively weak down to the ion. So they all appear here. Okay. So the point is that while these have to come from the core H6 plus, uh, sorry, HD3 plus, actually, these lines, uh, all this fire infrared emission can come from kind of cluster modes. In a handwavy way. Okay, so what are we doing to try and test out this model that made some completely outrageous claims? Uh, so how am I going to justify them? Well, of course, we need to model in detail the extinction curve based on our little dust model, our H2 matrix, with some uh, ionic impurities at the surface, uh, and then this surface state electrons in vacuum. That's uh, one focus. Uh, another focus, uh, which is kind of defocus, is that I don't quite know what to do with it, but maybe you guys can use interesting to find in which we can do this, is that um, because you have um, a dust made of um, a very abundant material, Function, then you can have quite a large uh, volume fraction of this. Um, and uh, that coupled with the fact that these surface state electrons have a sort of semi metallic character because they're completely free to move around the surface, drain uh, the radium respond like a little metallic drain. That means that uh, you can get significant interaction with radio waves, so you can get some contribution uh, to the refractive index in the radio regime from these dust particles, these hydrogen dust particles, which you can't get in the case of silicon graphite, silicate graphite atoms. Um, and so that means uh, potentially they're relevant to some of these funny phenomena like intraday variability, where you seem to, uh, if you assume it's due to ionized gas, you get these very high pressures. Uh, and then with the dust, of course, there's no pressure contribution at all. So you can shove as much dust in there as you like, as you need to make up your simulation characteristics. Uh, and there's no other pressure problem, which is great. Um, and the other really fun thing, uh, which we're working hard on, is that you know, I said these surface state electrons have a sort of metallic character because they're just free to migrate around the surface, from planar or spherical surface, just move around. 
That can be true, uh, but also you can get the other case where they're not true to me, because the strongest binding actually comes from the positive ions that are beneath the surface of the grain. And of course, they're discrete things uh, here, 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 here. And so it's possible to imagine uh, that an individual electron might be bound to an individual ion. So it's no longer free to run around the surface, but it's stuck just above the single ion. Okay. So it's kind of like an atom, it's like a one electron atom, like hydrogen, except that only half of the space is available to it, it can't get into the solid. And so it's kind of cool on potential outside the solid when it runs up against the wall. And so this is like a totally new and weird kind of atom, which I call halfium, you know, by half, half the space. Own movement in half the space. Uh, and that should have its own characteristic energy levels, just like any other atom. Uh, and so I'm working to uh, try very hard to calculate those. Myself and my colleague, uh, Arsene Tinsel, uh, and you know, are actually calculating what those are. Uh, and um, that should be very telling, because if we come up uh, with matches to his own uh, uh, transitions, and he's going to be able to place the same. Um, why and this is the absorption spectrum, uh, then that's a big plus for us. Okay, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Uh, I don't have any point in digging in, just have a less very good solar system are too big, all the big grains shouldn't be there in the standard model side. So you have to have hydrogen grains, and you can get them from uh, this population of uh, cold, dense gas clouds, which I uh, postulated 15 years ago. <coughs> um, and uh, if you're going to have that, if you're going to have these grains, the charging is, is critical to their survival. Uh, and yeah, the ionization industry would be really, really, really interesting. Um, that's what I wanted to say. I'm hurrying this over time, so. So you've got to be a bit careful about what you, um, or I should be a bit careful about what I say. Um, so I'm not trying to say that there are pH now. There's sort of the interplanetary space, for example, there are heaps of silicates, there are asteroids, and planets, and all these things. And so the issue is you've got to, uh, I'm personally splitting off all of those things from the question of what is the solar dust. And they could quite conceivably it's quite feasible that they're completely separate questions. Because circumstellar medium, what's around the star, is not necessarily what's all of it. What's the thing to So, as you say, you could know, certainly separate off that question the same way. So, what does he think the Ulysses mission was detecting then? Sorry? Do, what did you think the Ulysses mission was detecting then? At the end of the day, was it hydrogen? Uh, that's my suggestion, yeah. Uh, I don't know much about that area, so you will notice that all my slides about that were basically well, not stolen, but uh, appropriated from Bruce, Bruce Graham's talks. Um, and so I'm going to go to the conferences and meet people and find out more about that. Um, but, um, yeah. So, yeah, so, so I don't know enough to make a, to, to, to make a very clear statement about that, except that. Um, that appears to be a natural connection to make between this piece of the area and the data. It seems like a natural explanation. Uh, but I'm sure the planetary community will be at least as outraged as the, you know, the astronomy community with these ideas. So um, you know, I'm kind of not expecting a very warm reception. But 
you remove the, the, the pressure problems by by getting uh, deriving place perturbations from these these gradients. Uh, do you have a, a relationship between the, uh, the given, that relates the base perturbation to the density in the gradients, the column density? And then do you run into a problem with the number of these gradients that you require to, uh, to make the given for the base perturbation? Uh, we don't have that connection yet because we need to understand our grain model better. We don't understand our own grain model yet. It takes a while to develop the theory, but as you uh, on the previous graph, there's a few components there. Uh, if it was just the molecular, the hydrogen molecules on their own, that would be fairly straightforward to model. Uh, but the fact that it was the ions and the electrons that it makes it difficult. Uh, so we don't know what the, apparently what the conversion is between phase A or F phase, um, and the column of dust, if you like. Um, but I doubt that there's a problem. Uh, in just in terms of the numbers, uh, whether or not there are uh, implied problems, for example, uh, it might imply that um, a certain amount of radio wave fade requires a certain amount of optical extinction, okay? uh, which uh, then you have to check and see whether or not that's consistent with the, the observations. At the moment, we have neither, I think, the observations nor the prediction of the certain amount of extinction. So, I don't think we even have the oscillation of the edge, which would tell us whether or not the edge would cause that effect. So, probably the right way to do this is to make the prediction first. And then go out and check on that. Is there anybody awake online? No, I just don't have to go because I think that's a good thing. Okay, should we do? Mark for a nice stimulator. <laughs>